I skipped class all the time because I thought photography was the lamest possible thing you could do. I just didn't get it. I was like, this is so boring. It's just pointing your camera at stuff. Um, I do this for a living now. And so it's like kind of what my whole world revolves around now, you know. Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed Podcast. We've got Mark Raycroft coming to us from Ontario. Jason Loftus coming to us from Utah. Well, I'm Ron Hayes coming from Wyoming. Our guest today is a landscape photographer. We've only had a few landscape photographers on the show. I think only a couple. Um, but if you look at Ryan Dyer's work on Instagram or on his website, uh, I think you'll see that he's kind of a different breed of landscape photographer. And we're hoping to get into some of that, some of the the workflow that he uses to come up with the images, because it's not just an image. It's a, it's a piece of art. Um, that Ryan puts forward, and we're excited to talk about that. So, Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, and th- thanks for the uh, kind introduction. I'm not I'm not worthy of such nice words. Oh, I think so. I think 152,000 <laughs> people would disagree. <laughs> and, I, and I bet only 90% of those are bots. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. Ryan, we like to start with one question and, and it may, it probably will be different for you. We've had all kinds of different answers to this. Um, what is your favorite ever outdoor experience? Oh man, I've been peed on by coyotes. I've been stranded in the desert. Favorite. Um, favorite. Let's see. <laughs> the, the, the peed on coyotes was actually a good trip. I, 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 uh, I was solo backpacking, um, this ridge that was, um, just to the South of Mount hood called Tom, Dick and Harry mountain. I think they call it that because every Tom, Dick and Harry can climb it, which is kind of the climbing I'm into is just nice walks. <laughs> uh, but I was snowshoeing up. It was a, it was a winter trip and I was by myself and, Got to the top, camp camp just below the top in the tree line, and was waiting for sunrise in the in the morning. So, went to bed with a good book and a little REI candlelight thing. Fell asleep while reading. The little candle caught my tent on fire. Put put about a baseball sized hole in my tent before I could put it out. And then I woke up the next morning after narrowly surviving death by fire. Um, <laughs> And I, I got up and I walked out of my tent and there was coyote pee all over my tent, like just pools of yellow pee all over and coyote tracks. And uh, then I went, uh, I laughed it off and went and shot an image of Mount Hood that I still really like to this day, which I I can say that about very few of my photos. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a good trip. Fun solo experience with uh, interesting stories to tell about it. You know, th- those are always my favorite. The, the trips where it might suck at the time, but uh, they make good stories. I actually heard Stephen Rinella. Do you guys know Steve Rinella? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, don't know him. Uh, know who he is. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, you've seen his show. I was listening to him talk about types of fun one time. There's the cheap fun, which is like going on a roller coaster fun for a few minutes and then the expensive fun which is not fun when you're going through it but it's awesome when you look back on it and tell the stories you know that was awesome dude but uh you you got to work hard for it and, and embrace the suck as you're going through it you know but uh yeah that, that's that's probably one of my favorite times hmm. so so do you know anything about the coyote behavior i mean is there I've never heard of such a thing. That's that's crazy. I mean, you must have been in a in an area that they were used to, or they were marking their territory because you were there, or any ideas? I have no idea. I'm, I'm not like you guys. I, I I have zero idea about wildlife and natural traits of animals. But um, and it could have not been coyote tracks. It's what it looked like to me. Um, I mean, it 
could have been, you know, somebody's poodle that just <laughs> came up and peed all over my tent. But uh, <laughs> I, th I think it was coyote tracks, but I'd, I'm not as knowledgeable, knowledgeable about that stuff as you guys probably are. I think it probably was. Uh, do you have a dog? Uh, no, not anymore. So yeah, sometimes if your if your gear is around a dog or a family dog, it's it is a marking. Yeah, I had, I had a, a dog behavior. at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a dog at the time, so that may have been it. So that's crazy. <laughs> it's fun though because you, you wake up and and realize that you're you're not just part of a landscape scene; you're part of the entire ecosystem at that point in time. Yeah, and that's half yeah, the that, fun of getting out. Yeah, that's that's part of the experience is just being out there knowing you're you're not in your territory you're in the animal's territory and uh just experiencing being alone in nature is you know something i always look forward to so ryan where do you uh, you call the pacific northwest home do yeah. you primarily focus on the pacific northwest because i know you've got images from all over you know north america or all over at least the west yeah um i've shot a lot here in the northwest um i was born in kansas city i came out lived in portland at five years old and then moved up here to seattle about 10 years ago um it's just so between portland and, and seattle i've shot a ton of stuff here in the northwest to the point where i've kind of done it all and i'm not thrilled on doing more of it but uh I like to get out into the Rockies quite a bit. Um, been doing Namibia uh, uh, every year pre-COVID. And uh, I do Norway every year. But uh, yeah, the I mean, just the West is the most of my portfolio just because of ease of access. Sure. Your recent Instagram posts, out of the gate, I just have to ask out of curiosity with the volcano. Are those yeah. recent? No, those were back in, I've got some from 2013 and some from 2016. Um, the lava's not flowing actively in Hawaii right now. It just kind of, you, you can't even really predict it. You just have to be willing to, oh, it's starting to happen. There, there's an eruption and uh, okay, I'm get online buying a, buying a plane ticket. But uh, yeah, I was lucky to go out and work with uh, my good friend Bruce Amori and Miles Morgan to run a couple tours while that was going on and uh, show people the lava flows. And yeah, I'm very fortunate to have done that several times in my life because it's it's not like any other type of shooting. Most of the type of shooting I do is you're sitting down in a nice, nice field of wildflowers and watching a pretty sunrise, but uh, the lava is like actively scary and dangerous you don't get adrenaline from shooting wildflowers in mountains you know <laughs> you got to chase the light in those scenes which is those moments those fleeting moments are exciting yeah. but yeah a volcano you're this there are such powerful images you created it's like the one i mean i don't know if you were using a telephoto otherwise you were standing in it um, the one with the explosion that yeah one? and it seemed like the, the 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 lava rivers are like coming right to your feet kind of thing Oh yeah, there's a uh, yeah. You you can get pretty dang close. It, you know, it feels like you know when you've cooked a pizza in the oven and you open the oven, and it hits you in the face with that heat. You're like, well, um, that's what it's kind of like standing next to it. That you can only get so close before you're like, okay, I, I'm gonna burn myself. But um, yeah, you can actually get pretty close to it and, and shoot it. Um, you know, you can melt your shoes. Doing that's it. that's but, what uh, I was just going to ask. I've got I've got to ask about the shoes and the life of the shoes post volcano photography. Yeah, you can you can melt some shoes. You can melt the uh, the feet on your on your tripod. Um, but I mean, it's just such an experience. It's worth all of it. Yeah, and then you know the other extreme obviously is the Northern Lights. Is that what you typically photograph in Norway? Obviously, there's some yeah. incredible landscapes there as well, but. Yeah, the, the northern lights are normally the main thing I'm going out looking for in Norway. Um, it's another – I, I say normally that the lava and the northern lights are the two coolest things I've gotten to experience in my life. Um, two totally different types of things. But, but uh, yeah, I remember the first time I saw the northern lights with my own eyes. I, I was on a photography trip. 
And for the first 15 minutes, I didn't even pull out my camera. I just, I remember I was laying on my back in this field on the way up in the, in the Arctic and just watching it, just watching it dance because it's so, you know, you, you see a time lapse of it, you see photos of it, but when you see it for the first time, you go, oh, it actually moves really fast. And sometimes it kind of flickers and, you know, just these crazy waves that you you don't realize how fast it moves, which is fascinating. So I always try to remind myself when I'm out shooting it, take a few moments and just soak it in, you know, which I think every photographer should do. We get so stuck in getting the shot, get the shot, get the shot, get the shot that sometimes we we miss making some memories of the moment. As lame as that sounds. No, it doesn't, doesn't sound lame, lame at all. all. Yeah. <laughs> Wildlife photography. I mean, sometimes you just have to stop shooting to appreciate exactly what it is you're watching. Well, yeah, especially because you guys put it, put in so much effort for what you do. Like, I, I don't know that I have the determination or the patience to do what you fellows do. I mean, it's a whole different ball game. I've always thought of landscape photography requiring more patience because of having to go That's to. What I was just going to say to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you've got to train your eye for the right scenario where the light's going to be dramatic and play and create a landscape scene, and then plan where you're going to be to make it work, and then wait. Whereas, yeah. you know, we're actively searching for the animal to put in the image, whether it's hiking or glassing from points, and then hiking. It's to me. My my instinct is would feel like I'd have to have more patience to be a landscape photographer because you get that one shot that that day, whereas yeah. wildlife we could have four hours with that animal and just build a bank of yeah. images. But you're you're but going I, for that. I, I feel like you guys have to put in a lot more effort to to even find what you're going to shoot. You know, I go out and I kind of vaguely have an idea of what to expect and where I'm going to shoot and kind of what I'm going for. Um, but you guys actively searching, you know, hiking, glassing, like you said, um, that's a lot of work. I mean, uh, you, you guys might as well be pretty hardcore, you know, hunters, but you just shoot a shoot a camera instead of a rifle. I mean, the the things you guys have to go through to get your shots is it's to to me who sits in a field of wildflowers, it seems like torture. <laughs> Uh, what's funny is I think a lot of us, I, I, mean, I, I might be speaking out of turn for Ron and Mark, but I know for myself, I love the idea of landscapes. It's just always a constant battle um, between, you know, that's the, the best time for the light is, you know, that first hour of light or whatever, right? And, you, you know, I'm always battling. Do I want to be in a scenic spot trying to get a landscape shot or do I want to be with the critters trying to get, you know, with them with the right, light, right? So yeah. it's interesting. I've... I've taken a few, I wouldn't even call them landscape shots, just, you know, scenic shots. And yeah. I like the idea of the stuff I see. I mean, it's incredible. Your work's just amazing. And, but yeah, I, did, I don't have the patience to, I want to be out chasing critters. So it's always a battle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, if you're in someplace beautiful, the, you know, you're, you're not in front of an animal, why not, you know, take a landscape or scenic shot. But uh, yeah, I'm, see, I'm that way with wildlife. I, I'm, I've got maybe seven wildlife images. All of them suck, but I'm <laughs> I'm very much this I'm this opportunistic wildlife shooter. Like if it's there, I'll shoot it. I'll I'll not do it well, but um, I'll I'll do my best. But the, you know, and when I'm in front of an animal shooting it, it's I quickly turn into like your average tourist with a camera. I just I have no idea what I'm doing. I I just point and and, and spray and hope, but uh. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think so it's I, the same. I, it's the same. The majority of the time for us with landscapes, it exactly. it's got a yeah. honestly. The light pops out from behind the clouds, and you're in the right spot, and you've got the the Alaska range out in front of you in the in the yeah. middle of the fall, and the tundra's burning up with reds and oranges. Yeah. That it has to smack you in the face that hard for me to see a good landscape shot, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I struggle with, with just seeing, and I think that leads us kind of into one of the biggest topics looking at your work. I mean, obviously you work very intentionally. I try and to. So as far as workflow, 
kind of explain if you would your process? Um, yeah, so I'll go to a place vaguely having an idea of maybe what I want to shoot, where I want to shoot, kind of what the place might look like if I've never been there. I don't do a ton of research. Like I, I don't, at this stage in my photography, I don't want to go out and shoot a place that other landscape photographers are shooting a bunch. Um, or, or if I do, I, I like to put my own take on it. But So I don't do a ton of research about a place before I go to it. As in, I, I don't look at a lot of photography from the place. Um, so when I get there, it's kind of fresh eyes. And, and uh, then it's just, I just start walking around with with my camera in front of my face, looking through the viewfinder, trying to find compositions. Um, I tend to be fairly addicted to shooting the wide angle dramatic stuff. Um, mountains are my favorite. So, you know, I'm always in the mountains. But uh, yeah, it's just finding three elements that work, work together. It's finding a, a foreground that ties into a midground, and then a mid midground that ties into a background. If I can do that in a way that you know they all tie in together, they lead the eye through the frame, then I feel like I've at least done my part for that day. And then it's just waiting for good light, you know, which I'm sure, like you guys, doesn't happen nearly as often as you'd like it to. No, you know, sure. so, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically it, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, and I'll normally return to a place over and over. If I found a, a place that, that, uh, I really like, I found a composition I like, but I didn't get the light I wanted. I'll go back to the same spot 20, 30 times until I get it. Um, which is rather annoying you know, I'd, I'd like to get in there, get it done, and, and then go, okay, check that one off the list. But, uh, yeah, I just uh, – I get kind of hyper-focused on on a shot sometimes, much to my own detriment. But, uh, yeah, so it's it's just, you know, like you guys sit in glass. I, I sit there with my – with my face behind my camera looking through the viewfinder and just scan around. I'll just walk all over the place looking for that composition that I feel does the most justice to the scene, or at least conveys um, my idea of my interpretation of the scene as lame and like art cool, the art college kid, as that sounds. Um, yeah. It's kind of what I feel the landscape is. So, uh, yeah, it sounds incredibly lame, but it works for <laughs> you. Though. No, it, it I guess that's my you. answer. The, yeah. the images speak for themselves. So, I mean, oh, thanks, the man. art, the sure. artist spin. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, what's that? Is that your background? Did you go through art school? Uh, no, I I'm a four time college dropout who studied <laughs> philosophy. Um, yeah, I I got out of the military. I got into to uh, college, dropped out four times, and worked dead in jobs until I made this my career. But uh, I was always artistic when I was a kid. Um, I was always into, I tried painting, you know, watching Bob Ross grow, growing up when you stay home from school sick. I'd watch Bob Ross and talk my parents into getting me uh, canvases and oil paints. And I sucked at it for the first week. So I gave it up like children do. <laughs> um, I took photography class in high school. I skipped class all the time because I thought photography was the lamest possible thing you could do. I just didn't get it. I was like, this is so boring. It's just pointing your camera at stuff. It'd be just how not exciting. And, uh, I was, I was failing the class and I had to, I had to get an A on my final project to be able to get a D in the class and pass. I procrastinated like I always do with things. And at the last minute, like, you know, the night before this project was due, I turned to my two best friends who were in the class and I said, give me any shots you guys are not going to use in your final project so I could <laughs> slap something together. <laughs> so they they reluctantly gave me a bunch of their photos to kind of put together this bulletin board presentation. And uh, I aced it. I, I totally aced the project. My buddies got B's on their project. I got an A with their images they weren't using. And, uh, yeah, that's, that was my introduction in, into photography is just being a piece of crap about it. 
And here I am to this day, still a piece of crap with photography. Well, hold up. When did when did the, the the switch get flipped? When did the realization that photography was something that could Okay, let me say, I, I've got some quotes off your fantastic website. One is, a decade later, photography has not only become my career, but what my existence revolves around. So that's a very different vein of energy around it. So what happened? Um, honest answer, or politically correct answer. Honest. 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 We're all about honest. <laughs> um, uh, I, I uh, got sober from my opiate addiction and was just kind of in this place. When you get sober from something, there's this huge void in your life of like, well, what do I spend my time doing now? Mm. And uh, for me, I spent that, you know, uh, I had gotten a gift uh, of a camera, uh, a Canon Rebel with a kit lens, crappy little thing. I'd gotten that as a gift and uh, decided, okay, I'm just going to take this when I go snowboarding or, um, take this when I just go on my, I, I took a lot of solo road trips just to kind of figure out my brain again, because your brain chemistry gets all screwed up from drugs. And uh, just kind of spent a lot of time alone traveling to to find myself again. And uh, I, then I just started taking pictures of the places I went. And uh, it started to be fun. You start to realize um Oh, this picture I took is better than that picture I took. I wonder why. And uh, and then you get online. For me, it was Flickr back in like 2007. I got on Flickr and I was like, whoa, there's people who are really good at this. <laughs> and uh, just started learning about photography and, and just getting excited about it. And it, it, there's that snowball effect. And maybe it's my addictive personality. But uh, yeah, I just got addicted to shooting you know it was just it became everything i did you know i all all my friends i have now because when i got sober i got rid of all all the friends i had who were who were junkies like me and uh i didn't have any friends so all the friends i have now are i, I made through photography i met my wife through photography um i do this for a living now and so it's like you know it's it's kind of what my whole world revolves around now you know Everybody I know shoots. My wife shoots. We we sit down at, around the dinner table and talk about photography. Um, as much as my my kid hates that, but uh, yeah, it, it was just kind of filling this void that I had, you know. Well, big props on getting through that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Big props. Thanks. Yeah, totally. It's a tough one Appreciate to come it. out of. Before we get to Jason's question, I I think if you look at the the three of us, and I know Mike as well, I think our wives, significant others would describe us as addicts also. <laughs> yeah. You know, it yeah. just happened to be, it happened to be what, what caught us. Yeah. And it, it's probably about as expensive as help having an opiate habit. <laughs> oh, okay. Both, yeah, both are very expensive. One's a lot more healthy for you, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is, expensive thing to get into but you know the tax write-offs are nice right yeah right <laughs> <laughs> jason you had a you had a comment a few minutes I, ago. I actually just had a comment yeah it was funny because i ryan when you were mentioned how you had to go back to a spot 20 times to get the shot you were looking for and to me that's exactly where the patient things comes in right um yeah it's like you're looking for the right skies and you know you might have everything you need in the scene but if you don't have some clouds or some storm or some kind of a mood in the sky it kind of you know detracts from what it potentially could be right but uh, yeah yeah definitely yeah. it's uh and that's where things like you know you track the weather as best you can i'm not a meteorologist i'm just i look at my phone it says hey there will be clouds and i go okay th there's a possibility but um it's also tracking things like uh the direction of the light so there's apps you can you can get on your phone that you know you can scroll in on the map pinpoint where your composition is going to be and that it'll t tell you you know on this date the light's going to be at this angle coming in from here and so i've got all these spots that that i want to shoot and i go okay this isn't going to be really prime until you know august you know the second week of august or so um so that's a lot of it too 
so you know i've i've got all i've got you know on my notes on my phone all these lists of places and the best times to shoot them but uh yeah it's it's a lot of patience less patience than than what it takes for you guys to just sit there hoping an animal comes out <laughs> yeah, i would just say it's different exactly. i would just it's say it's di- different yeah, it's different yeah. for sure i mean I, I'm, I'm gonna go to a mountain and know the mountains there you guys are gonna oh, go out sure. oh, looking for light. animals your dramatic yeah. images so it, quickly if you don't mind what one or two of those apps what are they that people can um, find for light turkey? so there's photo pills i use that a little bit um it's kind of an expensive app um i don't know that you know, everybody should pay for it. If I'm honest, that they gave me a free download code because people sometimes think I'm cool on the internet. Um, the other one is called the Photographer's Ephemeris. That's a really good one. I just shows you, you know, uh, sunrise, sunset times, moon phases, uh, direction of light. Uh, so th- that's a that's a really good one that that I use quite often. My favorite part of that tool to use is is milky way because we've got i mean we've yeah. got some in wyoming we got some of the darkest skies in the country so yeah. we'll go out and photograph the milky way the photographer's ephemeris will give you it'll tell you exactly where it's going to be at a certain yep. time and when the core yep. is going to be visible and all that kind of thing so it is a great planning tool yeah yeah absolutely i, I use it that way as well and it's it's not cheap either, is it? It's about the is it about the same as photo pills or a little cheaper? Um, I got it so long ago, I don't remember. Um, I want to say it's a little bit cheaper, and I definitely want to say I like it better. Um, so that would be the one I would suggest. What was the name of it again? The photographer's eph- ephemeris. Okay. If we if we're talking about because I've got some buddies that are she well one in particular she's a really high-end uh landscape images and yep. and um astrophotography yeah but he will <laughs> i mean there will be 800 shots in his image in his final image because he's you know he'll wait for the sun to you know highlight to pop on one leaf if he's shooting in the pacific northwest and then as it kind of makes its way up through the trees or it might you know, have uh, have some sun rays, God rays coming through the trees as it kind of makes its way around and casts some shadow. Yeah. So how much of that enters into your workflow? Are you seeing a final image and then working backwards? Yeah, so I'll do a little bit of stuff like that. Normally, though, it's with like uh, seascapes where you've got, you know, okay, I've got the perfect wave crashing in the foreground and then I've got this nice little wave that's that's just kind of cresting over in the midground, and then this other wave that's crashing against the sea stack, and you kind of piece all those bits together. But um, as far as most of my stuff, you know, up in the mountains, um, I don't do a ton of stuff like that. Um, you know, I'll focus stack when I have to for depth of field issues. I'll exposure blend when necessary, but that's that's not even so much necessary nowadays with modern sensors. But uh. To your point, I I do like to pre-visualize my shot before I take it. You know, as I'm shooting, I'm consciously thinking about how I'm going to edit the photo later. And that allows you to go, okay, I, I'm going to need this piece, this piece, this piece um, to piece it together in, in post. So, yeah, it, there's a lot of consciousness about what the final shot's going to be when I'm shooting it. Um, but, um, I'm not as dedicated as your buddy who will wait for the perfect light on a single leaf. <laughs> That's well, uh, it, that, yeah, I was just throwing that out there, but yeah, yeah. I mean the, he puts, he puts as much time into his post-processing as I do in a weekend trip to, to photograph wildlife, yeah. you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put in, you know, seven to 10 hours on, on a shot if I think it needs it. Wow. Yeah. All right. wow. I, I'm no longer going to get, get what's the right word? I'm made fun well, of anyway for the fun. amount of editing. <laughs> yeah. Well. But it's, it's a crap ton of dodging and burning. I'll sit and sure. So, so where, whereas your friend will sit and wait for the perfect light to come in on, on a, on a single blade of grass or whatever, I'll dodge, you know, 
every little branch of a tree just to get some more directional light going on it. Um, grasses and flowers, you know, burn in some shadows on one side and, you know, pop some highlights on the other side just to get more three dimensionality in there. Sorry for our audience. Um, these are new terms. <laughs> it's and I, quite a creative know, we, process. We know yeah. what you're talking okay. about and, and probably the originator, I don't know if he was the originator or not, but certainly the first master of dodging and burning was Ansel. Ansel Adams, yeah, with the, the, the black and white images. Adams, right? Yeah, for sure. Yep. And he was doing it in a dark room. So could you kind of explain that? Yeah. I mean, you you touched on the elements of that process, but could you kind of explain what you're looking at when you decide where to apply that technique? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's just, it's just basically taking a blank layer, changing the blend mode to either soft light or overlay, and then painting with a dark colored brush or a light colored brush and either darkening down some pixels or brightening some pixels. And uh, for me, it's, it's normally to enhance directional light. Um, so if there's, if there's, you know, say there's some good light in the sky and good light on the mountain or whatever, and there's just ambient light hitting the trees or the flowers in the foreground or whatever it may be. I like to go in there and, enhance that that ambient directional light um, just to make it stand out more because I think that gives more of a 3D type of feel to a two-dimensional medium. Um, th that's my favorite kind of thing to do. Like I said, um, I tried to paint when I was younger and I gave it up after a week. And, and I've always said that if I could paint, I'd probably chuck my camera out the window. Uh, that was always what I wanted to do. Even before I got into photography, um, I did, you know, I was always interested in and researching um, oil painters, landscape oil painters, Hudson River School um, oil painters and and the masters. My favorite painter of all time, Albert Bierstadt, uh, just the way he handled light and depth and, and composition um, always fascinated me even before I picked up a camera. So for me, a camera is it's it's the plan B because I suck at painting. Um, and so I, I do take a lot of that inspiration from painting. Um, I put that into my editing quite a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly liberal with my with my Photoshop usage. Um, I try to keep it as true to the scene as I can, but I also like to kind of paint over the top of it and, and enhance things like that, you know? But that's, I mean, with digital media, that's part of the process, right? Yeah. I mean, any yeah. raw image that you take, you've got to manipulate anyway. Yeah, for sure. So it's just, yeah. It's creating well, an art form. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's art, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For, for me, that's half the fun. Half the fun of shooting is being out there, experiencing nature, um, going off-road and up in the, in the Colorado Rockies to go to some, you know, 13,000-foot mountain hanging out with your friends, drinking beers around a campfire. That's a lot of fun. But I also have just as much fun sitting at here, drinking a beer by myself in front of my computer for seven hours, probably more than one beer after seven hours. That's a big <laughs> beer. Just, just, yeah, just, uh, just sitting there, you know, painting over my photos. That's, that's half the fun I have too. So mm -hmm. You can see that in your work. And I, I just want to quickly throw out another quote from your website that illuminates this philosophy. Uh, you've said on your website, my idea of creating imagery seems to be constantly changing with the times. And I take artistic liberties with the process of making my own style of art. And you can see that in your work. Yeah. I And I feel it's good to give, give people that caveat when they're looking at my photos that they go, okay, we know that this is there's a lot of Photoshop that went into this. Um, I, I try not to hide that. And I don't think anybody would look at my photos and go, oh, that's straight out of camera. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm still constantly learning new things in the field and, and in, uh, in Photoshop. That's half the fun. That's what keeps me interested is continuing to learn. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, part of the fun for me is pushing the boundaries of the, what I've been doing and, and, uh, getting through those creative ruts that I go through. Um, and I, you know, it, 
it's like writer's block, but, but for photography that I get. And, uh, I always get out of it having learned something new because that forces you to try things you wouldn't have tried before. And, uh, yeah, so it's just, just continuing to push my own boundaries. There's something on your website that I just stopped at and would absolutely love to experience that pushes boundaries, changes the subject a tiny bit, but you do photo tours called all star storm chase workshop and the storm chasing images you have are, phenomenal i mean i just the power of those visuals to to be standing there well yes. I've, I've i've got to stop you there because okay one those are not my photos um oh this store this storm chasing trip um i'm kind of guest leader along with a uh a couple very seasoned storm storm chasers slash okay. photographers um and so this is actually going to be my first time going out Storm no, no chasing kidding. something right, I've, okay. I've always, I've always wanted to do it. Um, you know, I, I used to watch that, uh, what was that storm chasing show on the discovery channel back in the day? The guys have those like armored vehicles. They drive into tornadoes. Um, yeah, it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, it'll be like doing the lava and seeing the Northern lights. It's going to be this very crazy experience. I hope. Right. Unless I end up like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but, That's uh, the risk, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm and the cow go flying by the car. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Debris. Just hold on to your camera. We've Keep got that shutter going. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. It'll and it'll be a cool new challenge because it's so different from what I do. I mean, it's basically just pointing your camera at the sky and clicking the shutter. Um, a lot of the work is done and just tracking the storms which i don't know how to do but we've got a guy who professionally tracks storms coming with us um so it, i'm hoping to go out there and put my own take on storm photos just because so many of them are you've got a crazy awesome sky with a little sliver of land in the bottom and uh while i love it i also want to try to maybe incorporate a little bit more landscape into it I'll probably fail miserably because there's not a lot out there except wheat fields and telephone poles. But uh, that's what I was going to ask. Are you going back to Kansas to as a as a starting point? Because I know those guys can they can start in Kansas, but they could end up in Colorado. A couple of years ago, we had nine tornadoes around us here in Douglas, and we had storm chasing trucks showing up all over the place. So you can end up wherever. Yeah, we're 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 starting out in Denver and then just chasing to wherever. It's it's a from what I hear, it's a lot of time in the car. So also on your website, you have um, quite a few course online courses and tutorials. The Ultimate Landscape yeah. Photography Course. Sorry, sorry, Ron. Um, but if yeah, if you could elaborate uh, on those and what you offer people. Who I mean, the, your style of photography, I have to say, is hugely popular for, you know, that your images. I love putting my more dramatic wildlife images on HD metal now. But, you know, those yeah. landscapes would just pop beyond. I mean, just yeah, become I, real on the wall. I do like the metal quite a bit, especially for the lava stuff. The lava just really pops on the metal. But um, as far as the tutorials go, it's uh, it's just basically sharing everything I've learned about processing and creating images. Um, it, it, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough. It's going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back and, and toot my own horn. And I hope it doesn't, doesn't come across that way. You don't know. Um, I've, I've, I've been able to develop a few techniques here and there that nobody had ever, nobody had been using before I started doing it. And, uh, you know, so I was able to start a couple trends here and there, um, and that's just because I'm I'm entirely self-taught. Um, all my influence has come from mostly painters and not photographers, and so I do things quite a bit differently than a lot of other landscape photographers, and uh, I like to teach those things. Um, you know, it's it's something fun for me. I feel it benefits other photographers who might want to shoot 
in a similar way that I do or edit in a similar way that I do. Um, you know, it's, it also helps pay my bills, which isn't a bad thing, but, um, it, it's a lot of fun for me teaching, um, post-processing that, you know, I meet a ton of people doing it. Um, I'll teach sessions on Skype every now and then when I've got the time and just teach people Photoshop and uh, especially beginners. It's very rewarding to somebody who's brand new to photography and kind of, you know, just getting their feet wet. They don't have a a, a big skill set yet and you can kind of give them a skill set that they'll use. Uh, it's really rewarding. And, uh, it, you know, it's, I'm honored that that, you know, somebody would want to give money to learn photography from a former opiate addict. You know, I've, I've, I'm proud of that because I've come a long way. Yes. But, yeah. Uh, be proud of that. Yeah. It's, it, it's a fun thing for me to do, to teach photography. It's, I have a blast doing it. So we'll put, obviously, as we always do links in our show notes, but direct people, what is, what is your website and, and how would they find your tutorials or or the best way to contact you for those yeah it's all just uh it's all right there at ryandyer.com um there's links to all the stuff that are supposed to be on a website and then uh it's basically at ryan dyer everywhere else on the internet i don't use the twitter um it's a little too too toxic for me in the, <laughs> the recent times but uh yeah just ryan dyer everywhere R Y A N D Y A R. Correct. Well, and I'll, and I'll just throw something out there too, just because it was when I went and looked at your website, I was looking at those tutorials and I'm definitely going to take some of them. And the reason I say that is because I think I've been kind of pigeonholed in just a, a wildlife photographer type of mentality from an yeah. editing standpoint to everything I do. And I've tried to do more what I'd call wildscapes or wildlife scapes, if you will. Yeah. Um, recently you know backing out zooming out trying to get more landscape in with the with the animals um but from an editing standpoint i mean i think it's a, you know any one of us that are doing wildlife photography could benefit from just learning different techniques and thinking about how to how would i apply something that a landscape photographer would do from an editing standpoint to my wildlife photography you know and i think Absolutely. all those things it, that we learn just makes us a you know more uh, broadens our scope and what we're able to do but. For sure, and and vice versa. Um, I've I've been lucky enough to to work the the past uh, four or five years with Marcel Van Oosten, and uh, you know he's he does a lot of the you know kind of he does a lot of the wildlife, but also the, like the wildlife scapes, you know, including um, the the landscape with the animals, and uh, I've learned a ton from him in his wildlife stuff that I can translate over to to uh, landscape photography. So I do think it's good to keep seeking knowledge no matter where it comes from. Um, Cause it, even if it's something you end up not using um, for every 10 things you don't use, you might find one that you do. And uh, continuing to learn, I think is what keeps people motivated. You know, it, in art, it doesn't matter what the, what the medium is. You you never reach a pinnacle. You you never go, oh, I've made it to the top of the mountain. This is as good as I'll ever be. Um, you know, you, it's always just a constant, constant growth in, until you die or until you give give up on doing it. There might be plateaus here and there, but uh, you can always keep learning. So just seeking out new knowledge, even from other types of photographies, something I think we can all benefit from. Yeah, well said, well said. The ride of life is shorter than we think, right? It just it it goes past. So why not? Yeah, do yeah. all you can. Amen. Yep. Yeah. I'm getting at an age where I'm starting to think about how many more elk ruts do I have left? In you know, yeah. realistically, you know, that's a when you look at it that way, it woo, it's you know, it's pretty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's me with my knees now. Uh, I'll be forty in a couple of years, and and uh, thirty five oh, hit dude. me hard. If you get going hiking and your knees just you're like, oh, all right, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm getting to that that point in life. That I remember my my dad complaining about this and going, whoa, he's so old. And, uh, 
you're, you're yeah, pitching but, to the wrong audience here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, yeah. the knees are starting to go. But all those little things make you go, oh, well, this might affect my shooting further on down the road. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mountains let's not dwell are, on it because are hard, yeah. to, hard. You know, they're not that compatible at times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've watched a knee replacement surgery on YouTube one time and it ah. don't, don't, do don't that. look it up. Don't watch I'm it. Yeah. <laughs> do not look it up because it's hammers and chisels and it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's Take the whole point of a general anesthetic. <laughs> oh, God. Right. Hearing, hearing the clanking. Oh, yep. <laughs> Come out of that with zero memory. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah the 40 that. knees, I'm, I mean, I, I want to encourage you, except that the 40 knees aren't even bad yet. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we dwell on this too much longer, we'll all end up in tears. Right, yeah. It was one, exactly. one of my uh, biggest reality checks in midlife. I was in Alaska, and just on this story, this point, I'd hiked – up a, a fairly, not a big mountain, but it's 5,000 feet or so up to do caribou. I was with four or five people and my son. I stayed a couple hours longer than everybody else because they, they, was, they were cold and things weren't happening. They went down. I was young. I was uh, mid-30s, late 30s. When I finished the shoot, I trotted down the whole mountain with my camera, with my tripod, bouncing from step to step, three-foot drop this way, that, down the mountain, not on one go, but enough so. The next day, I could not walk. That had never happened to me before. And my knees, yeah. for two days, my knees were like, they nothing was going on. Yep. And that was the first time I was like, oh. I, it, I didn't notice it at all coming down the yeah. mountain. So. Yeah. Reality somehow punches you right in the mouth. It did. <laughs> yes. Yep. It was hilarious. I'd get out of the truck the yep. next day with my son, and I'd just laugh because I'd take a step, and I was done. <laughs> so yep. this is ridiculous. Yep. Oh, so, yeah. brutal. Well, thanks. I've got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't happen now because I don't run down. I take yeah. my time, right? So, there you go. And, I, and, and, and I'm, I've got, there's a geriatric thing. <laughs> not to say this. <laughs> you can get these patella guards. That's just a strap that goes under your kneecap. They're quite mm -hmm. cheap. They're, uh, you know, 40 bucks. And it supports your kneecap on these elevated hikes and reduces the stress on it. So on your knees. I'm I'm going to need you to email me that. I can send you links. Yeah, but they're, they're please quite do. Easy and to we'll find. put a link yeah. in the show notes for the rest of yeah. you. That there are, you go. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> a big help, and yeah, there there's no weight to them, and and you don't even notice them when they're on. So yeah, because it's yeah hiking downhill now. That used to be my favorite part of hiking. You know, it's so much easier than going up, and uh, now it's oh god, it's brutal just going down with my you know, 70 year old knees. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look into those braces. I am. Out. Well, it's, it's just a strap and some have a plastic, a hard plastic mount on the front and other ones are just a little more robust, uh, material in the front. Again, they're, so, they're quite, so cheap. I'm, I'm not going to look like a childhood forest gump. Not at all. Not at all. But okay, the fun, good. here's it. So we did, we Until did you get all the accessories. No, <laughs> there you go. I, I put them under under my pants, and you don't notice them. You don't feel them. It's just a strap. I mean, it's an inch thick going around, and, and the material is is the ones that I have. They don't rub. They don't cause any issues at all. But the first time I used them, I did this. It was the first trip with my son doing doll sheep with a couple of other friends. And we came down the mountain. We did a group picture at the end of it. And I still have it because it's a great memory for he and I. I had them on the outside of my pants. And on the photo, it, they just stand out. It's like, what's he got strapped around his knees? Anyway, I, I, not many people see that image. Oh, so okay. well, let's I'll... get back to some happy little trees real quick. I got... <laughs> hang, on, hang on real quick, real quick. <laughs> just on that note, another really little trick that I've learned because I also hunt as well, Ryan. And mm – -hmm. Uh, I actually learned this packing out animals, um, but hiking sticks are a huge help, especially yeah. going downhill. So just you little. know what, that that's actually um, I had to learn that lesson like basically every lesson for my wife. I was like, use hiking poles, use hiking poles, use hiking poles, and I go, no, I don't need it. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm I'm good, and uh, <laughs> my knees are starting to to go and. And uh, she's like, I told you, use hiking poles. I tried it. And I was like, God damn it. She's right again. <laughs> so, 
Gotcha. Yeah. All yeah. right, back yeah, to happy. I'm definitely doing that now. Happy little trees. Sorry. All right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's happy little trees. So one um, little element that I kind of wanted to ask you about and kind of maybe have you touch on a little bit as far as your post-processing, but also how you're constructing the image in your mind as you're shooting. Do you use a lot of luminosity masking in your in your editing? Oh, yeah. And could you describe yep. for people, because it's a new tool on Lightroom, and it certainly is not as powerful as what you can do in Photoshop, but yep. luminosity masking is a is a fantastic tool for you know, those shots where maybe you had to expose for the subject and you had, you're forced to blow out the background or blow out a sky. Yeah. And so could you explain that for, for the listeners? Yeah. So luminosity masks came out. I remember them coming out in 2008, uh, a photographer named Tony Kuiper uh, lives in the Southwest, shoots a lot of sand, sandstone stuff. Um, he came out with them and it blew my mind. It was hard to wrap my head around it back then because there was no like video tutorials or things. It was just this really long PDF that he wrote describing how to use them. And I didn't understand any of it, but I kept playing around with it. Um, and the the way I like to describe it is, so the, the way selections work in Photoshop, you know, say you take your lasso tool, you draw a circle and whatever's inside of that circle is selected. Whatever's outside of that cir circle is not selected. Um, so it's kind of like this black and white thing, selected or not selected. Luminosity masks allow you to make selections based off of brightness values in an image. So you can say, I want to select the brightest highlights in this scene and not have any of the midtones or any of the shadows selected. Conversely, you could say, I want to select just the darkest shadows of this scene and not any of the midtones or the highlights. Or you can select just the midtones. And then you can also adjust it infinitely between those. So you could dial in a selection of just the exact brightness values or, or tonal values in an image, s make a selection of them, and then adjust just that range of, of brightness values. And you can make any sort of adjustment through it. So all, all of my dodging and burning, 99% of my dodging and burning is done through these selections. So when I'm trying to add, you know, extra ambient light onto, you know, the side of a tree, well, the side of that tree, if it's textured, it's got little tiny shadows in it. And so when I'm dodging, I want to make sure I'm not brightening those little tiny shadows that are in the tree, but just the, the parts that are being lit up by the amb ambient light. So I can dodge those out, not worry about dodging out my shadows and making the tree that that side of the tree look just washed out. Um, you could do uh, saturation adjustments in, in just, you know, just the highlights. Maybe you've got um, a scene with an elk in front of um, a dark for, a, you know, a dark tree line behind it and some grass and the lights coming in and really lighten up the grass and in the elk. So maybe you want to make some sort of adjustment just to the brightness of, of that image and not touch the, the background. So say you want to make a contrast adjustment, but you don't want that dark tree line in the back to get any darker. So you select your highlights. You can add con like a levels or, or a curves adjustment uh, just to the highlights of the image, for example. But uh, I use them for absolutely everything just because it's it's infinite control over your your adjustments in Photoshop. And do you outline these in any of your specific tutorials that you have on your website? Uh, yeah, my last one called Light Contouring deals a lot with uh, how I dodge and burn through luminosity selections to really enhance light. Um, it, people have seemed to really like it so far. Um, and I don't think it's something anybody else Maybe there's a few other people doing it. Um, maybe I'm not aware of it, but I think I'm the first one to to teach it at least. And uh, I've gotten some some good feedback on it that it's kind of a, a cool new thing that they didn't know they could do. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested, you can check it out. Awesome, will do. Now, how did the how did the classes come about? Did you do individual mentoring before you started doing the tutorials online? 
Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, a uh, long story short, um, when my wife and I, my now wife and I moved up here to Seattle ten years ago, uh, I was having trouble finding work. Um, was on unemployment for almost a year. Couldn't find a job. You know, the economy was still trying to recover. My wife and I had one of those big blood arguments that you have. And uh, it, it was just me venting because I I wasn't helping pay the bills around the house. And she was covering everything and being a man that bruises your ego, right? And uh, she was the one who encouraged me to try photography as a living. I used some expletives and told her her opinion was wrong in, in certain terms. <laughs> and... Uh, she says, well, you've got nothing else you can you can try. I'm a college dropout many times over. And uh, so reluctantly, I said, okay, I'll just see if I could make, you know, a little bit of money on the side doing this. And uh, so I started by teaching kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, infield stuff, teaching editing stuff, um, just trying to scrounge up some money and and by later in that year, it had become like a, I was booking things every single day and teaching people every single day. And then uh, that got to the point where I, I couldn't just be on Skype all day long teaching people post-processing or, you know, be gone every single day teaching people um, infield stuff. And uh, I've got a wife and kid at home. I, I don't like to be away from them so much. And so I started doing the tutorials and... Uh, it's been really cool because it, more people can access it. Um, I can I can show more. You know, it, it's hard to sit down on Skype and teach everything you know, because everything I know would take many many hours to teach. And so, this is a way I can show everything I know. Nobody has to sit and listen to to me mumble on Skype and fumble my way through things. Um, it's just direct to the point. Um, examples of, of processing and uh yeah it's been it's been really good I've, i have a good time doing it yeah i think they're great tools like you say you, you go out with somebody and there's going to be questions that you forget to ask but when you yeah. can sit and watch a tutorial many times over yeah those questions will come up and you'll think about things a little bit differently each time that you watch it and then the next yeah. time you have the opportunity to speak to someone, you'll know exactly what those answers or those questions are that you're searching for answers for. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And there's a, there's a lot of them out there, but you know there there are some that are much more well done than than others. And so when you look at your work and being able to derive that end product, you know that's the kind of workflow that someone should seek to model themselves after maybe maybe not depends on your <laughs> on your your taste but uh if they like what i do then then and they, they want to try to do something similar then i'm happy to show them well skill set can be applied to all kinds of different photography as well right that oh, yeah, Photoshop yeah. that you teach i mean as much as i'm sure a lot of people would love to emulate your high quality work and i'd say brother that you found your calling i mean you're, you're so Thanks, artistic. Man. Yeah, so artistic. Him. Hey, Ryan, do you mind telling us, like, what's in your what's in your bag when you go out on a normal trip? And what, what kind of gear are you shooting? You know, do you have a go-to lens? Uh, you know. I can, I can happily and gleefully say my bag is probably much lighter than your guys'. <laughs> <laughs> um, I carry three lenses with me and, and my D850. So I've got, yeah, I've got my D850. Um, I use my 14 to 24 a lot. Um, I've got a 24 to 70, and then I've got a pretty lightweight 70 to 300. Um, and that's kind of all I need for what I do with landscapes. You know, the 70 to 300 doesn't get used a ton, but um, the, the 14 to 24 is the real workhorse in my bag. Gotcha. 850. Yep. 850. Uh, there's, all of us used to have an 850 on this podcast until somebody just recently <laughs> I, did shed, I did shed tears though i confessed <laughs> did you did you jump to the dark side and go mirrorless tell me I you did. didn't go mirrorless i did do okay. that and, and how how was that for wildlife it was primarily for video 
Okay. I will say. And and for wildlife, it's, you know, it's a great system. I, I think it doesn't matter what company you go with or, or what camera you're picking up. You can get good images out of it. Um, but the the it wasn't necessarily the mirrorless draw as it was just the the opportunities for video and where i'm a hybrid shooter i don't need a true video camera true cinema yeah. camera and you know i i don't always carry a, a you know a rig that allows me to do manual focus um you know with a focus puller uh so a lot of times that autofocus that the new mirrorless systems have with wildlife video it becomes you know a very applicable tool and so yeah. that's what that's what the draw was more than more than anything else and i you know we've discussed this a lot that 850 is still best image quality out of any any camera i've ever shot and i've shot i do love it yeah you know one dx's i've shot uh d4s um it's still the best image quality overall so you're you're going to yeah, have to explain a focus puller to our audience at some point here, but I I just have to ask if that was a straight up joke or if there's a meaning behind going to the dark side for mirrorless. Is there something that is keeping you from mirrorless compared? <laughs> He's to asking that? because he is still hanging still, on. Oh yeah. Well, I, I mean, um, honestly, I'm ready to go mirrorless. I'm just waiting for the right package. I'm I, there. I, but I think I, I'm I curious. Am too. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I th it was just it, it was mostly a joke, uh, Good. just because okay. right. I, I I see everybody right. dropping like flies around me, going, "Oh, going mirrorless, going mirrorless." Right. Um, <laughs> I th I'm sure I will at some point. I went mirrorless before, so I went mirrorless on the um, original Sony A7R. Um, I liked it for a while. It was before Sony really had their lens lineup, and so I I was using an adapter to use all my Canon lenses on it and uh, at the time you know frame rates were slow um the the image quality was was good um i hated having to adapt my lenses and the battery life was disgusting you know i was, I was burning through three batteries a day um and so i used it for about a year and then gave up on it that's when i switched to nikon and uh been nikon ever since i think since 2014 2015 but um, I, I think I'm ready to go mirrorless as well. Now that there's so many options, they've they've fixed a lot of the problems I had with it. Um, the lens lineups look really good, and it'd be nice to save that extra weight in my bag. I mean, my bag's pretty light compared to your guys's, but if I could make it a little bit lighter, that'd be even better. I've got arthritis in my back, so I'm I'm always looking for ways to shed the weight. But um. Does that make well, you feel better, Mark? The, the rumors, <laughs> the rumors of the Z9 or Z9 here in Canada, the Z9 is something that we're hoping will be enough incentive. Yeah. And this new lineup of Nikon lenses, there's a, there's some definite eye candy in there too, if that comes to yeah. fruition. Fingers crossed. I'll I'll Thanks. I'll have to uh, ask you guys about it though. I'm I'm not the tech head. I, I don't I don't keep up with all the modern stuff. I I just I'm. I'm too busy playing video games. Well, on, on the Photoshop side, you definitely are. Yeah. So I try to. Sure. <laughs> head and shoulders beyond where I'm at. I'm I'm very rudimentary in my Photoshop skills. Yeah. That's fine, though. The, the, the goal is always to have fun, the most fun with what you're doing. And so if that means you you love what you're doing and you spend – not a lot of time in Photoshop. That's fine. As long as you love what you're doing and what you're making, that's that's what we're here for. Pro tip. Yep. <laughs> yep. Another. Just have There's fun. Been a few. There's been yeah, quite yeah. a few in this one, yeah. I just was going to ask, what's next for Ryan Dyer? What, what's the next big project? What What's exciting you on the on the horizon? Um, getting well, to travel I mean, again. Yeah, getting oh, to sure. travel again. I, I get my second Amen. shot here in a couple of weeks, and uh, oh, I've had God. to cancel so many so many trips. I, I was supposed to go to Italy, supposed to go to Namibia twice. All that was canceled. I had some you know stuff here in the states. Supposed to go to Montana, and that got canceled. It's so just um, 
getting to travel again is God, it's going to feel good. But, uh, yeah, the storm chasing coming up. I'm really excited about that. It's a, it's a new challenge. That's June. Um, hope, uh, yeah, June and July. Yeah. Late June, early Ju- July. I've got two trips back to back. So now are you guys yeah. doing workshops or are you doing, uh, is it just a personal trip to get some? Yeah. So it's, yeah. So it's a, it's a storm chasing tour. So we've, we've got a, a bunch of folks signed up and, uh, so I, I'm there to kind of teach some photography stuff and teach some processing stuff. And uh, we've got the the storm guys who teach all the storm stuff. So I'm just, just uh, I get to tag along and make a few bucks because. Uh, Put your life I, in their uh, hands. Yeah, I'm, I'm playing, I'm, I'm halfway decent at playing cameras. So they, they yeah. let me come along <laughs> to teach. That sounds like a fun trip, it really does. But ho- hopefully you guys can, uh, get out and it, I'm sure you guys are probably getting out quite a bit actually through the whole pandemic and in shooting Absolutely. locally. Right? Yeah, locally. yeah. That was the best yeah. place to be was outdoors and get your and vitamin D fix yep. and uh, just kind of you, you stay socially independent always when you're out there yeah. on purpose. Yep. So it, it was definitely the place to be. And I will say that there were a lot of people, uh, Darren Bennett, He's a photographer out of Colorado, and mm-hmm. Darren typically goes to Africa uh, in the summer and leads workshops and tours over there. But you know, with the inability to leave North America, he found himself doing a lot of storm chasing. And man, the content he got last year was unreal. Yeah, yeah I, I remember seeing some of it. Um, it, it just Every time I see really good storm photography, I just go, "Oh God, I can't wait! I can't wait!" Yeah. I've been sitting here this entire this entire year so far, going, "Okay, can I get vaccinated? Can I get vaccinated? Am I going to be vaccinated in time?" Because we're requiring everybody to be vaccinated just to be safe and insurance reasons. But uh, yeah, I can't wait to go storm chasing. It's it's going to be it's going to be an experience that I'm lucky car. to have. Yeah, yeah I want we'll, a fast car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we've rented all the Lamborghinis and Ferraris. Yeah, okay, right on. <laughs> we've fitted them with suction cups There's your for foreground. the cameras. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, not a bad idea. <laughs> That's Straight right. into a landscape social media influencer. Put a half a million dollar car <laughs> in front go. of the tornado, and that'll sell. Yeah. I'm into it. I'm into it. I like the way you think. <laughs> so, Ryan, what's the shot? We know what you got coming up. What's the shot that you really would like to have? Oh man, there's many. There's so many. Um, if if I was vaccinated fully, I'd be in Iceland right now shooting the volcano that's erupting. I would have left last week and just said bye to my wife and kid. I'm I'm a feats don't fail me now. I'm off to the airport, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. So. Um, there's this area far Eastern up a, kind of towards the Arctic in Canada called the Torngat mountains. Have you guys heard of them? The mm-hmm. Tor- That's Torngat right. mountains. It's on my list. In fact, I have a friend of the family who's a ranger there. I've thought about guiding in on a, do like a 10 day, two week trip into the mountains. I've been dying to get into that place. In Labrador. Dying to get in there. Um, Aside from that story about that guy who got his face ripped off by a polar bear a few years back. Never. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'll have to send you the link to it. It's well, that's a okay. fascinating story. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but I, I want to get in there. there. You don't see a lot of landscape photographers uh, shooting in there. Um, so that's been on my list. I'd like to get in the Torgengat Mountains and uh, do something fairly unique. Um, definitely unique to me, but that's, that's high on my list. That's something I'd like to focus on 2022, 2023, maybe. Rugged landscape. Yeah. You're the the first person I've, I've ever come across who I mentioned it. They go, oh yeah, I've been thinking about that too. So I'm in good clothes. The only reason I had heard of it is Mark has talked about doing it. Yeah. You know, in the past, so. Newfoundland is one of my favorite go-to destinations, is and it? it's not it's not far across to Labrador, so it's on the horizon. And, and and when it's on the horizon, it's it sinks into the mind. And then I I see yeah. images and and realize that there, are, I have a couple of colleagues that have been there and just see what they've done and and just yeah. experience. 
incredible yeah. wilderness. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I uh, that that's number one on my bucket list for right now. Nice, very cool. Look forward to seeing the pictures. <laughs> Me too. Pol- polar bears aside, <laughs> like something. Keep the face. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to be on Wild and Exposed today, Ryan. And it's been a pleasure to hear your story. And your images are truly works of art. And I honestly are very powerful and, and a delight to look at. So we appreciate your time and sharing some of your insights and skills and tips with our audience. I, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the the honor of coming on here and talking to you fine gentlemen. It's, this is my third podcast this week. And uh, I think th- I think this is my my favorite conversation so far. It's it's been a good time chatting with you guys. Oh, I'll but, you uh, say that to yeah, all the so, podcasts. No, I know. <laughs> and they're like, okay, all right, let me know when it's posted. <laughs> yeah, cancel, cancel in call. Um, but no, this this has been an awesome conversation. So I, I really appreciate appreciate you guys having a landscape photographer on to talk with yeah, you all. One hundred percent. Like you like you alluded to several times. We've all got to expand our horizons, and and you can't do that if you just keep yourself in a box. So, amen. Yeah, it, it, that's why I follow so many land or uh, wildlife photographers on Instagram because it's just one. I'm fascinated by by the wildlife, and two, I feel like there's a lot I can learn from from guys like you. So, all right. Well, thank you once again for tuning into this week's Wild and Exposed podcast. You can find more of our team's work on our website at wildandexposed.com where there'll be links to the things we've discussed today and links to all of Ryan's social media and website as well where you can dial in and see about these amazing tutorials and learn more about Photoshop through this man's skills and talent that he's amassed over these years. You, our audio podcasts go up on Tuesdays And our video podcasts go up on YouTube on Fridays. Please take a moment and give us a positive review, a five-star rating, a thumbs up. Those help us to gain traction in the busy world of podcasting. And until next time, you've been listening to Wild and Exposed Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed Podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way. We will be the biggest band in town.